This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We've looked at international law with say international sale of goods and arbitration and so on. We've looked at agency, we've looked at partnership, and so now it's time for us to consider company law. And the substantial part of the rest of the F4 global syllabus is um, based on English uh, corporates, corporations, English companies. Um, I don't know, principally because um, the ACCA is based in the UK, the examiners are UK people. Um, not all companies have got as advanced a system with reference to businesses as the UK. So the ACCA have decided that F4 should be based, the company law element of it should be based primarily on English companies or UK companies. So here we are looking at types of cooperation and the ways of formation to begin with. There are two types of cooperation. There are corporations sole and corporations aggregate, and you'll find that apart from about one minute when I talk about corporations sole, then the rest of the time on the rest of the F4 lectures will be about corporations aggregate. A corporation sole then is a public office, and it's occupied by a natural person, by a living person, and on the death of that living person, the public office continues. It's unaffected by the death of the individual who from time to time occupies that position. So for example, the Mayor of London is a, a corporation soul. It's a public office and it's occupied by an individual person uh, and that person dies, moves on, retires, resigns, is diselected if you like, but the office of Mayor of London will continue. A corporation aggregate is really a collection of individuals, of like-minded people that have decided to get together and create themselves into a legal entity, a separate legal entity, a corporation aggregate. So it's a collection of like-minded people that choose to set themselves up as a company. It's not the same as a partnership where the partnership does not have a separate legal existence, a separate legal identity. A company does. So a corporation aggregate is where we're going for substantially the whole of the remaining F4 lectures. Formation may be in any one of three ways. Uh, two of them are almost incidental now. Two of them are, are almost redundant in present times. The first of these is by royal charter. So uh, in times past when people wanted to uh, create a company, it was potentially available, and in the early days, it was probably the only way of creating companies by royal charter. You'd approach the monarch and say, look, we want to go to Canada and kill all the animals over there. Would you uh, create for us the Hudson Bay for trading company? And the king at the time said, yes, go and kill all these Canadian animals and bring the furs back and then we can all wear animal furs instead of letting the animals wear their own. Or will you create a company? Will you by royal charter grant us the charter to create the East India Tea Company? Uh, or the East India Spice Company, and then we can go over to um, the Far East and um, take their spices, take their tea, bring it all back for the benefit of the British people. Um, so those are created by Royal Charter. Many of the modern universities in the UK are created by Royal Charter. I was reading the other day about the Open University in the UK created by Royal Charter. Uh, and I believe Cambridge University, Oxford and Cambridge, were created by Royal Charter way back in time. But most of the modern ones are as well. By statute is the second one. Sorry, it's very rare modern times. You're not going to get the Queen or whoever our next monarch is, whether it be Prince Charles, Prince William, or whether we turn into a republic. You're not going to get them granting, probably, charters to, grant, to, to create companies. 
The next type is by statute, where British Parliament would sit down and create by statute. They would create uh, a company. Um, typically, they have the word British in front of them, and there were many of them, a number of them, until Margaret Thatcher was in power, and Thatcher and the Conservative government privatised many of these uh, companies. Now, these companies like British Steel, British Rail, British Waterways and so on, British Coal, these companies were owned by the public people, by us. It was owned by the government and of course the government is representative of the people. And so Margaret Thatcher then privatised them. And so I always find it a strange expression because she took it out of public ownership, owned by the government, and put it into ownership of the public, invited the public to buy something, to buy subscribe for shares in a company which already belonged to the public, which is, can you think of that? That is just so clever that you create an asset which belongs to somebody else and sell it back to them. And that was what happened with the many of the uh, companies that had been created by statute, British Waterways, British Coal, British Airways, British Railways, these were sold back into public ownership. And the third possibility, given that both those other two are exceedingly rare, the third possibility is by registration. So by registration with the um, Registrar of Companies, and we may now register a company, it could be um, potentially a very big company or it may be just a very small company. Um, so Tesco PLC, PLC is the accepted abbreviation for the words Public Limited Company and Small and Co LTD, the LTD is the accepted abbreviation for Limited which indicates that it's a private company. So if it has PLC or the words Public Limited Company at the end of the name, then it's public. If it has the words Limited or LTD or LD, then I'll just write those. LD is the other possibility. Then that indicates that it's a private company. And now since 2004, a new form of company, the Community Interest Company or a CIC, is available for registration these are for organisations that are created for the benefit of society or persons generally, benefit of the community in pursuit of good deeds like health, education, business, commerce, um, rather than for profit. So a community interest company is a relatively new concept, but it is a, a concept which does exist. And we'll have a look at that in a moment and tell you just how frequent or common these registered community interest companies are. Types of company, we public quoted companies, the share price quoted on a recognized stock exchange and it must be limited by shares rather than by lim limited by guarantee or even unlimited. It has to be a limited company and it has to be limited by shares. Public unquoted, again limited by shares but not quoted on a recognised stock exchange. And then we get the vast majority, I'll give you some numbers in a minute, the vast majority of companies, private companies. And first of all, we can have unlimited companies. What a rare animal that is. An unlimited company is a very rare beast. Uh, private limited companies, uh, limited by shares, private limited by guarantee, with a share capital, with no share capital. Again, um, unusual uh, limited by guarantee companies and then we have the community and just companies. Let me just have a look at this and, and give you an idea of the context of what we're looking at. In the world of companies, in the world of companies generally, there are around um, 3,650,000 companies in the UK at the moment. If you want to be precise, and you can be, or I can be, as at 31st of March, there were in fact 
3,648,478 companies registered in the UK, registered and active, subject to some which were in the process of liquidation but not yet liquidated. So 3,648,478, you're not going to be examined on these numbers. This will not be in your exam, but it's to put it into context for you. So don't need to memorise these, no need to write them down. So 3,650 companies. And these subdivide into public and private. And the numbers here are, for public companies, 7,297. I'm going to say 7,000. It makes it easier numbers. 7,297 is the precise figure. And therefore private, I'm rounding it again, uh, 3,643. private companies. And we can subdivide this as well because it might be there are public companies quoted or it may be unquoted. And if it's quoted, I don't know the precise number now, but if it's quoted, I think there's around a thousand public quoted companies, which leaves us with 6,000 public unquoted companies. The common misconception with reference to public companies is that they are quoted on the stock exchange and their shares are actively marketed and bought and sold on a daily basis. This is wrong. A public company does not have to be quoted. In fact, it's an expensive operation to have a quotation on the stock exchange. I believe, I've not looked it up, but I believe it's something in the region of three quarters of a million pounds each year for a public company to have a quotation on the London Stock Exchange. So it's a big step to take. Private companies, again, we can subdivide these. We're talking about three, six. Now, where have I got this from? Talking about three, six, um, four, three, and we're dividing this into um, limited and unlimited. And unlimited, I can't believe that there are more than around a thousand unlimited companies, unlimited private companies. Can't be an unlimited public company because by definition a public company must be limited and it must be limited by shares. So that will leave us with 3,642,000 in the private limited companies. And then we can split that as well because we can get limited by shares or limited by guarantee. And I can't myself believe that there are more than, say, 10,000 companies limited by guarantee. And that will leave me with 3,632,000 that are limited by shares. You see what the weight of companies are. You see what the main number of companies are. We can subdivide this guarantee one as well because it may have a share capital. It doesn't have to. Or it may have no share capital. And I'm, I have no basis now for these figures. I'm just going to say... 5,000 with the share capital, 5,000 with that. I don't know the precise figures. It's almost irrelevant. I hardly ever refer to companies, private companies, limited by guarantee ever again within these company law lectures. It's not the main drift of English company law. But this is limited by shares, 3,632,000. Let's just have a, a consideration of this figure as well. If we take 3,650,000 as the total number of companies, which is not going to be far off, if we accept that that's, that's the, um, the figure overall, and say 3,632,000, that means there's only 18,000 that are not private companies limited by shares. And 18,000 is half of 1% of 3,650,000. Nothing, is it? Business 
of UK businesses, and this includes partnerships and sole traders, 99.3% are what is called small businesses. That is people that employ or have involvement of fewer than 50 people. Huge proportion of businesses are carried on by individuals, partnerships, companies with less than 50 people involved, fewer than 50 people. So 99.3% of businesses, that's not 99.3% of business. We're talking there of this, this 7,000, this basically 1,000 quoted public companies account for greater than 90% of business in the UK. But 99.3% of businesses, organisations, are small people. Now, just with reference to the CIA, CIC, is the Community Interest Company, started in 2004. We're looking now in 2017, 13 years, and there are, my latest information, is that there are 13,744 community interest companies. That's as at 2013, 2015, uh, September 2015, is the latest information that I had. So... There's a, a growth there. We're talking about 1,000 a year, talking about, what, 20 per week being registered as community interest companies. On average, 20 businesses per week are registering themselves as community interest. Now, we talked, obviously, about public companies. And public companies, these 7,000, these are the ones that are generating most business a huge proportion in excess of 90% of business is conducted by principally by this 1,000, but generally by the uh, 7,000 public companies. But to be a public company, it has to satisfy the definition. Now, pay attention because you may have, probably do have, uh, a set of notes, not necessarily exactly the same as these, but probably a set of notes which I need to update and, and amend because the law has changed in one respect here, and I've only relatively recently been convinced that this in fact is a change in law rather than um, rumour. But a public company is defined, didn't used to be incidentally, it used to be the case that a private company was defined by law and that everything else was by default public. But the, the onus has shifted 180 degrees. It's now public companies that are being defined and if it doesn't satisfy the definition of a public company, then it must be private. Which is, is interesting, again, we'll get to an aside in a moment or two. It's public if it satisfies the definition. It's a company which is limited by shares. I've already said this twice already. It's limited by shares and therefore it's not a company limited by guarantee and it's not an unlimited company. It's a company that is limited by shares. It has at least one member. Well, you can't have a company with fewer than one member, but it used to be the case that it had to have at least two. No longer. That is now no longer part of a public company definition. So I do need to update these course notes. So it has at least, <clears throat> it has a member. The Constitution, now the Constitution is now the Articles of Association. The memorandum is no longer part of the Constitution. It used to be, but it's no longer. The Constitution is the Articles, any resolutions that amend the Articles, and any contracts that affect the Articles. So that's the Constitution, but the Constitution states that it's public. The memorandum will state that it's public. The Articles of Association will state, these are the Articles of Association of ABC, public limited company, so they will state that it is a public company. The name ends with the words public limited company or with the acknowledged abbreviation and it may be that if it's uh, registered in Wales rather than registered in England and Wales, if it's registered specifically in Wales, then it may have the Welsh equivalent which are the letters CCC 
and the words, you do not need this, you will not be examined on it. I'll try to remember it because it's a bit of fun. And the Welsh people that are listening here will probably mock my Welsh attempt, my attempts at Welsh accent. Cumni, Cufungedig, Cyhoesus, Cumni Cuffe, which is the Welsh equivalent for the words public limited company. If it's unlimited, it will be Ancufungedig. Cumni Ancufungedig. But you will not be examined on that. It's just, as I say, it's a little bit of fun. I'm going to scrub that out before you can even see it so that you don't bother copying it down. It has an allotted share capital of not less than £50,000. Great. But at the moment, before Brexit, we're still in Europe. And as a result of being in Europe, and I don't know how Brexit is going to affect UK companies, it may have an allotted share capital of not less than the euro equivalent of £50,000. Now that's interesting because that is changing. Before the Brexit vote, one pound was the equivalent of one euro forty. As at today, the day I'm recording this lecture, one pound is now one euro eleven. So those people that voted for Brexit and had investments in, in Europe or in Euros have really suffered. It's like a turkey voting for an early Christmas. So if you had a share capital not less than 50,000 in Euro equivalents, the Euro equivalent of 50,000 would be, let me work it out, about 35,000-ish. So 35,000 times 140... Yeah, 35,000 shares at €1.40 works out at um, £49,000. So just over, a shade over €35,000. Am I right? No, I'm wrong. I've done it the wrong way around. Um, 50,000, €70,000. We could have had 70,000 euros, and that was the same as 50,000 pounds, but of course that's now changed, because 70,000 euros is substantially more. Makes it interesting, doesn't it? Of which not less than 25% is paid up, together with the whole of any appropriate premium. So... When British Telecom was talk, taken to the public by Margaret Thatcher, the strike price for the application for shares, the, the details of the share application, to make it easy on people, to make it not a financial, an excessive financial burden, we had to pay 50 pence on application. And then we had to pay 40 pence when we were allotted the shares on allotment. And a further 40 pence one year later on first call. That's what we had to do. 50 pence on application, 40 pence on allotment and 40 pence on first call. Of which not less than one fourth, one thirty, therefore, was the strike price. And when shares are allotted, the public company shares are allotted, they have to be or issued, are paid up, they have to be on the basis of not less than 25% paid up. I don't know where I'm going with this because it suddenly appeared that in fact it is more than 25% paid up, 50 pence on allotment is more than 25% of the of the one pound share capital. So that was the, the basis of, no, it's not less than 25% is paid up in cash, together with, oh, together with the whole of the premium, that's where, on application. 50 pence on allotment, but one pound 30 
25% of the share value is 25, plus the whole of the premium, which is 30, that means 55, and only 50 was payable on allotment. How do we get around that? Of which not less than 25% is paid up together with the whole of any premium. And the answer was they created a receivable. So when you paid your 50 pence, you then acknowledged that you owed another 80. So they debited a receivable with that 80, and therefore they were able to credit share capital with the full one pound and credit share premium with the excess 30 pence. So that was a, a little bit of jiggery poker, a little bit of juggling done by the Margaret Thatcher government. So that's where 25% that puts it into context with some figures, together with the whole of the premium, which was that 40 pence for British Telecom. A company with which doesn't satisfy the definition, I've already said this, a company that doesn't satisfy the definition of being public, <laughs> therefore it must be private. And if the share capital falls for whatever reason, if the share capital falls below the 50,000, then it reverts to being a private company. You have to notify the registrar and say, oh, our share capital has been reduced below 50,000. Can we register as a private company? Although public company is created from the date which is shown on its certificate of incorporation, and that is without question, whatever date is shown on the certificate of incorporation, that's the date the company was created. This applies to a public company or a private company or an unlimited company or a company limited by guarantee. If the date is shown, as it will be, where the date is shown on the certificate of incorporation, that's the date that the company was created. Now, that's interesting in itself. We'll come to it later. But remind me, will you, that there is a case called Gibson and Barton. And I'll tell you about the case, but let me re-emphasize this. I've said it before when I was teaching, when I was lecturing, recording the agency law, when I was recording partnership law. Case names are not examined. You do not need to remember case names. But you do need to remember the point of law that the case illustrates that the case established, that the case confirmed, whatever verb you want to put in there, past tense of the verb, you do need to remember the point of law. And that's why I continue to tell you the story, but there's no need to remember Mel Gibson and that bridge over the Manchester Ship Canal called Barton Bridge. There's no need to remember case names. And I will tell you about Gibson and Barton when we get to a later part in another lecture. But meanwhile, although a company, public company exists from the date which is shown on its certificate of incorporation, it cannot, it is not allowed to commence trade until it has received a trading certificate. There is a move for the requirement of trading certificates to be removed. But at the moment, at the time of lecturing, a public company needs to obtain a trading certificate from the registrar before it is entitled to commence trading as a public company. I'm going to leave it now. I'm going to end this lecture and we'll start the next lecture with trading certificates. That's half an hour, I think, of time which we spent on this one. That's probably about as long as you want to pay attention to me.